start off with some invocation prayers. Om Ajnana Samarandasya Jnananjana Salakaya Chakshun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Nama Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Vastratya Deshatarine So, I just wanted to thank Breeza for such a nice, beautiful kirtan. <laughs> Much love and gratitude for to all of you for coming out tonight. Canyon and Bree. <laughs> so I thought that perhaps we can discuss, we can talk about how to overcome apparent struggles and difficulties that may arise in life. Because we live in a world of duality and it doesn't matter how beautiful you may be, how much wealth you may have, how much strength you may have, how detached you may be. The dualities, it's the duality is the very nature of this world. There's 7.9 billion people on this earth. And there's a saying that everyone that we may know, perhaps every person, is undergoing some struggle that we don't know of. That may be true. Therefore, we should always have compassion for everyone. I wanted to narrate a story. Of a yogi's journey. This is a factual story of a American and Western boy. In his late teenage years, he was yearning. He was seeking God consciousness, self-realization, enlightenment. And he was born and raised in the West, but his heart called out for India. And so he risked his life traversing the Middle East and finally reached India and he made it to his destination, the Himalayas. And there is where he adopted the life of a sadhu, a yogi. A yogi is in particular a person who renounces all material affairs and dedicates his life solely, entirely, to God realization, who lives in the sacred lands and immerses themselves in spiritual practice. So, Again, he was a teenage yogi from the West, from America. And he was trying to bathe in the sacred river Ganges. And little did he know that 
Jesus passed on. So it's really dark outside. And he's on the riverbank, and he's submerging his feet into the river. And he's immediately swept away by the current, which would have taken his life. But he was immediately grabbed by a huge mountain like Yogi, who threw him onto the riverbank. What he didn't know is that when people are to bathe during that time, they chain themselves, they shackle themselves to the riverbank so they're not overtaken by the current. And so this mountain like Yogi had threw him onto the riverbank and started chanting these mantras for his protection. And seeing that he was very inexperienced, um, he didn't know what to do from then on. So the senior yogi, feeling compassion upon this, on this person, took him under his wing. And he was learning from that person, from that yogi, what it means to pursue that lifestyle. And so in the, in the Himalayas, he taught him how to, how to reside in certain caves or what, even the little things like what berries to eat, what plants to eat, what are, which ones are poisonous, which ones to avoid. Mm. He taught him how to coexist amongst other yogis, sadhus, who may be of other traditions. But he explains in his autobiography that one of the most important lessons that he learned was to was how to coexist with wildlife, with nature. Because we live in they were living in the jungles. So they're surrounded by so many snakes, and vipers, and cobras, and tigers, and wild elephants. It could have easily taken his life. And he explained to him that the moment you think that you're superior to these other beings, they will devour you. Therefore, you should see with equal vision, with equanimity, the divine, the super soul God within all their hearts. So, traversing the path with this senior yogi gave him so much insight and realization of his own. Interestingly enough, is that this, he learned so much from this senior yogi. He was learning from so many gurus when he was traveling amongst India. But he learned the most from this person. Interestingly enough, the senior yogi didn't speak a word of English and the the junior yogi didn't speak a word of Hindi. So, but because there was such a strong desire of the student to learn and, and the teacher to teach, just by the simple nod of his head or a glance, he knew what to, what to do and what, and what not to do. Yeah. And then as, as the weeks went on, the younger yogi realized that he was, he felt as if he was intruding on his, on this older yogi's life because he was a person who was quite private, preferred a life of seclusion. So he thought that I should perhaps carry on by, on my own. So, upon departing 
they had embraced and a tear, tears were actually shed from the senior yogi's eyes. Even though they had a short time of experience together, they they developed this ras, this relationship of fatherly and son affection. And so the reason why I share this story is because I feel like in life there's always so many things that we may struggle with. We may, not, we may not know how to navigate through certain experiences or if we're entering into a new scale or a new lifestyle or a new life situation. But by there's always somebody who's more experienced, a person who can give guidance and mentorship, who can encourage us, who can inspire us, who can give us, impart realizations upon us, who can protect us, who we can confide in, who we can take shelter of. So that we may gain faith in our practice or, what, or whatever it may be in our lives. And such people are called guru. Guru is not only the person who initiates into the Sampradaya, the one who gives the name, but Guru is also the person who gives mentorship. There's different levels of Guru, and there's the Guru that shows the path. What's so critical is that Guru who gives guidance on a regular basis. Some food for thought on the topic of mentorship, taking shelter. Would anybody like to ask any questions or give any comments? Anything related or anything, or want to share anything that came to mind, or any realizations? <laughs> sure. Yeah. When you were speaking of superiority and that need for viewing others equally to ourselves and just that equal vision. Um, I got chills because I realize I've been dealing with my own superiority complex mm. and how mm. that shows up in my life and how it makes me anxious when, I mean, the truth is um, I've realized that my circumstances and like things have been devouring me, situations have been devouring me, I've mm. allowed my energy to be swallowed up and allowed myself to be diminished by feeding that wolf, mm. you know? And it's, yeah, just, I'm just happy that you, you said that, because it seriously, it made an effect on me, that's all I really have to say, thank you. I appreciate you just being so like raw and vulnerable and just saying what I think most people go through. Unless it comes to the platform of higher level awareness, we're subjected to the, the inclination to act on the basis of our egos. And that's essentially why we have these material bodies, why we're in this material world, is to act on a desire that we are the external self, but I, I think that, 
I think that through a genuine spiritual practice, we can become purified and be free from those, those lower tendencies. And that's the quality of a yogi, is that he's free from, from false ego. Thank you. Um, so, um, this, I, I hope this relates to what she just said or asked. Um, there was, uh, you know, there, there was a period of time, um, like one of the rituals that you mentioned in your lecture was uh, bathing in the mm. sacred river. Um, I'm very new here. This is my first day here, but people have talked to me about four regulations. It, you know, those sorts of principles. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I'm looking back at like a time in my life when, um, just to piggyback off of what she said, like, you know, when, when you do not have a car or a house, when you're, you know, basically, it's not really like being homeless. You still have a home. You still have a place you sleep and a city you call home. But, you know, you're homeless. Uh, it's, um, I mean, I, uh, I, I guess the question is, what, what do you do when these very material, like, like uh like what would be we'd be doing if we could not afford the instruments or there could not be a meal served or like what what do you do when you actually are n not not like first world problems hardship but like what do you do to maintain these practices you know and to not feel senses of superiority or inferiority or disconnection of that kind when when you are exposed to violence when you are living in a really extreme poverty and stuff like that like um what is what is the um what is the defense against you know something that very materially and physically can hurt you on your path mindset i think that whether we live in the material world or whether we are yogi in the himalayas a yogi in Vrindavan, the sacred lands of India, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, if somehow or other if we can see how that the situation that I'm in is literally the will of the divine, the will of God, and to see how this test, the will, Will I allow this situation to take away my peace, my realizations, my spiritual advancement, my dedication and faith in God and the spiritual path? And seemingly difficult experiences can actually be seen as a blessing with the right mindset. And sometimes we may not understand a certain situation at first, but we look back in retrospect and few weeks time, a few months time, and we realized, wow, I'm really glad I went through that experience because it only brought me closer to God. And I sometimes take those experiences to, to reach another level. But poverty is not necessarily a bad thing, you know? <laughs> In poverty, like, last seven years as a monk. <laughs> but it's... Um, even if you don't have not, if, even if you don't have anything, right? If you have nothing, but we have Krishna, and Krishna is everything. Then, for a devotee, for a bhakti yogi, a yogi in the path of devotion, that's all he needs to feel the highest fulfillment in life, the greatest contentment. Hare Krishna. You had a question here on the left, Jesse. So just kind of a comment, if I may, to the last question. Sure. 
Um, counting japa <laughs> is a good defense to when you're going through struggles. Mm. Absolutely. But for those of you who don't know what japa is, japa is the chanting of the Maha Mantra or the divine names of Krishna. There was a japa bag here. Okay. Oh yeah. So these 108 beads on the japa mala and we can fix our minds by chanting the Maha Mantra each time on each bead. And in this way, just come back to recentering ourselves and understanding our position in this world, calling out and feeling the, the shelter of the divine, of God. So yeah, Japa is the essence to always keep in mind, Krishna. Risa. Yeah, also to comment on what you just said, um, you know, it reminded me of this like saying where between stimulus and reaction, there's a space. Hmm. And that's where mindfulness can come in. And um, if I can just share my experience a little bit, my mindfulness practice has also been with, you know, chanting japa. Um, and it's a practice, it's a muscle you have to stretch and it takes time to develop it and also to, in a sense, reap the benefits. But um, if you put in the dedication and the hard work and the said will, um, you can, uh, um, overcome hard times and view it with a different mindset because I think everything is mindset and even those who are most poor you always hear are the happiest and you have to ask why is that um, but for someone who you know maybe had a really nice life and a change comes that change is hard to accept at first but like I said it's mindset and that's a practice thank you yeah Good idea. I had a question related mm. to your answer. So you said mm. like even if we are in uh, any difficult situation, we should uh, think of it as God's will, mm. uh, the, the divine will. Um, I just wanted to ask like, uh, is it God's will or is it our own doing, our own karma? Because God is uh, loves us all, right? He wouldn't mm. want us to be in a difficult situation. Uh, but I mean, uh, but if we are in, uh, it's our own doing, isn't it? Both, I think perhaps because of our karma, we're put, we're put into certain situations. But I feel like God is our ever well-wisher, would only put us in those circumstances so that we can learn and grow and come closer to Him. And it's really from struggle we gain strength. That's just the law of the world. Yeah, there's a, uh, so I don't know, if anybody here used to listen to Bob Marley? Or listen to, his, or listen to Bob Marley? It's like only one person here listens to Bob Marley, for sure. <laughs> um, he has this quote, and I think it's really beautiful. He says that we don't know how strong we can be until being strong is our only choice. And that's when we really start to shine. When, we, when we're put in these adverse situations and we're completely perplexed, that's a really good time to start praying to God. <laughs> to start connecting with Krishna. And so I think that Ultimately, it's it's all situations are meant to purify us and bring us to a higher enlightened state. Does anybody else like to ask anything? Thank you. How does one go about 
um, finding a guru or a Excellent mentor question. or guide? Arjuna said you don't look for a guru, he walks into your life. So, um, excellent question. How does one go about finding a guru? I think that according to the Vedas, according to the scriptures, the sacred yogic scriptures, one should see who is qualified by observing his qualities and that uh, he's speaking what's what's in alignment with the ancient teachings the vedas that he's he has the qualities of a, of a devotee of a saint and that he speaks shastra that he speaks from the teachings but I think it's simultaneously both. It's a two-way street where we're, we should be seeking a guru. And then there's also the guru will present itself. But there's three different gurus, as we know. There's the guru who shows us the path. It shows us the path towards enlightenment. There's the guru who gives us mentorship and encouragement and guidance. And then there's the Diksha Guru, the Guru who initiates, the one who gives the name and connects us with the Sampradaya or tradition or lineage. And so, primarily in the story that I was sharing of the yogi, he was relating to the other yogi as a Shiksha, as one who gives mentorship and guidance. And we can find those Gurus in our community, in our spiritual community. It's anybody who can really give us guidance. The other day, um, we have this, we have a huge congregation of about a couple thousand people. And there's this little gal, she's probably about seven, eight years old, but she's been learning how to cook from her mother since she was born. So she's this expert cook. She's way more qualified than I'll ever be. And um, so we were in the kitchen here, and she was making a few different preps. Oh, I'm sorry, she was assisting her mother who was making a few different preps, and she was teaching me how to make these like fried, these deep fried potatoes. And um, I learned a lot from her. Even though she was seven years old, she was my guru. So, <laughs> so a guru could be anyone who's further along on the path. Thank you. Is, is there any other comments or questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, this actually touches on um, the anecdote you related earlier about okay. the um, American who traveled to India, and um, what the woman over here, hi, um, commented about um, the issue of regarding um, oneself as superior or just the concept of superiority in general. Hmm. Now, for an adherent of Sanatana Dharma, um, regardless of one's tradition, it is it's central the idea that um, a soul is embodied in a form which has which is then, if it fulfills its karma in its life, is then dies and reborns into a new form which has a higher potential for consciousness. It's not necessarily more enlightened, but you have the, the greater potential for enlightenment. This is correct, right? Depending on what form? Depending on which bodily form that we receive in the next life, then yes. But if one fulfills, um, but if the one fulfills, if a, a being fulfills its karma within a life, not, it's not a guarantee that one then transitions to a um, form with a higher capacity, but the cycle of samsara, if you live in accordance with karma, eventually that is the path that you travel, correct? So you're saying that if, if, if one 
is alleviated of a certain type of karma because he's finished that in the one life and then the next life he's has a raised consciousness that wouldn't have to experience that karma? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that, that, different, um, that different states of being, like um, well, you mentioned that there were, there were snakes and tigers, and right, you know, right. to that we could also add insects, perhaps. Mm. Um, now, all of these possess a soul, right. and each of these beings has a karma, but none of them, because they don't have, um, they're not human, they don't have the capacity for self-awareness, they Correct. still have karma, and upon death and rebirth, they will pass from one form to another. Sure. Okay, so then, if one should not regard other, be other beings with a sense of superiority, then how, what is the appropriate relationship then to mm -hmm. beings who are not as advanced on the path? Right. Who, who do okay. not, um, to other beings which do not have the same level of enlightenment or which do not have the, at least do not have the capacity for the same level of enlightenment. I get your, I see your question now. Thank you. Right, because this, it, it, this seems to imply that there is a natural hierarchy of beings. So if there is a hierarchy, how do you avoid this attitude of superiority then? Excellent question. Well, we, we have to see from the internal perspective that externally we may or may not be superior, but internally we're all equal because the quantity, the quality of the consciousness is the same in all beings. The quality of my soul, the quality of the soul in an animal's body, in an insect's body, in a, is, is, is the same soul. And so, to see with that inner vision is to see beyond the modes of material nature, is to see in the mode of transcendence, because we're seeing that we're seeing the sacredness of all life and how we're all just part and parcel of Krishna, of the divine. Whether it may be whether it may be that we may reside in different bodies. So on an external level there may be some differences. My body is more superior than an ant's body or a grasshopper's body. But on an internal level, we're equal. We're all traveling on the same path. We're all due to achieve Krishna consciousness at some point. But the quality of ourselves are are equal, are equivalent. So thank you. So any other comments, last comments or questions? Oh, yes. Daniel, could you? You can bring it to her, Trevor. Yeah. She's right here. The, this is my first time here. This may be a pretty naive question, but in different spiritual practices that I've been involved in just trying to understand kind of follow from that what the gentleman just asked was what does it mean to fulfill your karma and what just understanding karma to fulfill our karma well we are all predestined to experience certain experiences even before we're born, you know, we're all, we're all allotted a certain amount of pleasure, enjoyment, a certain amount of pain, and so all of us, in in when we're fulfilling the cycle of samsara of repeated birth and death, we will, we will have to fulfill our karma. Your that? purpose. Our purpose is that what karma is meaning. Your purpose. Car uh, that is that's dharma. Dharma is purpose. So, karma is having the experience of actions and reactions, and dharma is is the very essence of who we are. You could even say the very purpose of something. So the very purpose for ourselves as as spirit souls is to 
lovingly commune with the divine and purify our consciousness. Sure. Okay, so yeah. So thank you all for joining us this evening. So last couple of announcements. We will be um, hosting a yoga retreat this Saturday. If you're not too busy, where we'll be having a yoga class here in Pacific Beach, followed by a vegan lunch, and we'll be having a hike at Three Sisters Falls Trail in, in Julian. And uh, so if you'd like to participate in that, Andrea will be by the table, and she can sign you up. There's um, a lot of donation box there. If you guys feel like you guys want to contribute anything, it goes towards making the dinner for the following week. And uh, is there anything else? Thank you to uh, Damodar Kumar. He's also going to be gone for about a month soon, in a few days. So, uh, <laughs> but he's scheduled to come back. So, <laughs> um, also, is uh, I think I think I think Ali here? That's her name. Is she here? No. Okay. All right. Anyways, somebody contacted us earlier, and they said they might stop by, but I guess they didn't. So, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.